All right, all right, all right. Wow. <clears throat> so great to see you here this morning on this Super Bowl wet, wet outside Sunday morning. Let me just ask real quick, are you happy to be here today? Yeah, yeah me too, me too. I see so many different jerseys represented out there today for the team of your choosing. But uh, boy, I tell you, it's going to be exciting later this afternoon. But it's also going to be exciting in here this morning as we continue in this series. It's called Love is a Battlefield. Today we're talking about fighting to stay in love. Guys, guys, Valentine's Day is almost here. Man, hopefully you have gone out there and already gotten that cauliflower ordered, huh? <laughs> Man, that was a great idea. What a great idea that was. I love it. But now we're talking about love, 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 and how it is that we can stay in love. And boy, I got to tell you guys, um, as we begin this morning, by the way, grab your notes, grab your Bibles, grab your pens. There's a lot to write down this morning, a lot of stuff that's not already outlined for you there on the notes. I'm going to have you scribbling in the margins. I want you to write down a lot of stuff, and we're going to get through it today. But, but man, I tell you, we're talking about love. And how many of you, how many of you just love love? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. We all love the love, and we all want to continue to love, and we want that love to last. And, and I, hey, listen, listen, listen. Kim and I have been married for 30 years. Yeah. 30 years. How about that? Give her a hand for that because she really, she gets, yeah. And, uh, but I'll be honest with you, man. I'll be honest with you, and she'd be even more honest with you that sometimes it's tough. Sometimes in those 30 years, it can be difficult. Sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes you fall in bed late at night, absolutely exhausted from a long day's marriage. <laughs> and you're going, what do I need to do? How can I continue to stay in love? Listen, listen, I want us today to start to get a vision. Do you guys know that over half, over half of all marriages end in divorce. And of those that survive, probably most of us would agree that not all of those that survive actually thrive. Instead, it seems to be a very few that have that extra something by which they stay in love throughout the entire race. I believe the Bible has a lot to say about that and gives us a lot that we can go by here this morning, things that we can learn in order to continue on in that vision that God can give to us for those marriages that last. Now, too often we become roommates instead of soulmates. But what if, what if there's so much more for each of us? Have you guys noticed even those who've been married for a few years or, or five years or 10 years or 50 years that sometimes at the beginning is not always the same as where you are now? Things change along the way. What you used to do, maybe you don't quite always do now like you used to. That love seems to fizzle a little bit. That love seems to ebb and flow some. There was once a time when you were so very excited and maybe you're not quite as excited now. And you would notice that that is quite normal. Do you remember the first time you took that love to the movies? Do you remember that? And you walked up to the concession stand and there the concession stand you you looked at her and you said, hey, I'm going to get me some popcorn. Do you want some popcorn? And she said, no, nah, don't buy me any popcorn. I'll just have some of yours. <laughs> and you were like, oh, 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 how about that? Because you knew that the bumps of the hands would occur there in the theater. And, 
and the thrill and the excitement was there, man. But now, now you go to the movies and you're going, hey, I want some popcorn. Do you want any popcorn? She says, no, I'll have some of yours. You're like, get your own. (laughs) What is wrong with you? You eat all the butter pieces. Come on. And things change. Man, I tell you, several years ago, Kim and I went out to eat with a with a couple, and uh, we went to this really nice restaurant, really nice restaurant. We, the maitre d' walked us in there to our tables, and we all began to sit around our tables, and, and Kim sat down, and I sat down, but then, but then this, this guy that, he, 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 he walks over, and he pulls his wife's chair out, and she sits in, and he helps her scoot that chair back in, and I thought, what a jerk. You did not just do that. You did not just do that to me. You expose me for who I am now. And yeah, it once might have been there, but maybe now not so much. But how can we how can we put more back into it? How can we revive the the fire? in our relationship that maybe we once had. How can we fight to stay in love? And this, this is where I want you to really get the vision, okay? Get the vision in your head. I told you guys earlier, Kim and I, we just celebrated 30 years, 30 years. And really for me, for us, I'm, we're go, oh, if we can have 30 more years. Can you even imagine what it's gonna look like 30 more years? on top of the 30 that we have and and how incredible that would be and what that would look like if we just could have 30 more years. And and in the same way, we're going 30 more years. You might be going, if I could have 10 more years or 20 more years or or whatever, wherever it is you're at, thinking of those, that age when you're old. For me, 30 more years, I'm going to be right at 85 years old. Kim, she's going to be right at 70 years old. See, see, I, I just got me some points right there, okay? <laughs> so take note, guys, take note, all right? But God, imagine, 85, 85, and that marriage still there, and that marriage still strong, and what that would look like, and, and that we would still enjoy being together. We would still laugh together. We would, we would walk around the lake together still. We would, we would take hits on each other's oxygen tank together, you know? We, we, I'm just kidding there. But we would enjoy one, to get a vision like that. And when you get the vision like that, you begin to run towards that. You begin to move towards that. You have to take steps, purposeful steps towards that. Steps. You know, C.S. Lewis said something, and this is kind of a little side thing here. C.S. Lewis said something, and he wrote a book called The Four Love Languages. And in The Four Love Languages, he talked about different kinds of love. And he talked about eros, love, um, where you get the word erotic from, or that's kind of romantic love. And around Valentine's Day, we think a lot about the romance. And, but he talked about a deeper love, a greater love, a philos r- love, which is, which is a friendship kind of love. And he said that the difference, and if, if it's a picture and you're getting a vision, the difference is um, with the Eros love, uh, you're looking at each other. You're looking at each other. He said, but with the Philos love, you're, you're looking, standing side by side towards the horizon, towards that vision of what you want to be. And he said, and it's that deep friendship of, of walking with that person, of running with that person toward that common goal. And he, he said, that's the deeper kind of love. So many of us, when we, when we get married, it's out of eros love. It's I'm attracted to you, you're attracted to me. But at some point, it has to be, it has to go to that deeper kind of love of you're my best friend. You're my best friend. And that best friend is a bond that can hold two together. In fact, um, for those who are single, let me suggest uh, this one thing real quick, real quick. Uh, when, when you perhaps walk into a room of 20 other singles 
And when you walk into that room and you start looking through the filter of Eros, you know what often happens? Is instantly you count out 17 of those 20. You're going, well, not my body type, not the hair type I like, not the eye color I like, not the, not the size, not the shape, not the, and boom, no chance. But when you walk in instead with a philos filter, you're going, friendship first. Because friendship is such a foundation. I'm not going to count people out according to all. I'm, I'm going to friendship. Let's go according to friendship. And so, so very often, that's where you find that one that God has picked, that God has chosen in that deep friendship, which is that, that deeper kind of love that is so important for our marriages. I, I realize that's kind of off to the side right there, but certainly something for us to think about. But here's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to get, we're going to hold on to that vision and whatever it is, how many years, we're going to hold on to that vision and we're going to look at the steps that we together can take moving in that direction. And we go to this passage of scripture, which is found in Ephesians. This really is the classic marriage scripture that so many often refer to. But Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 through 28. Now, before I read this to you, I printed up the notes, typed them all out. I sent them out on Tuesday of this week to all the staff and uh, said, this is, this is the outline for the sermon here this Sunday. And very quickly after I sent these things out, uh, there was a pastor, one of the pastors of the church, at my door, at my office door, and he goes, dude, man, you are brave. And I said, what? What are you talking about? He goes, man, I saw the scripture you're going to, and, and you're going to, to that scripture that talks about submit. He goes, man, you're brave. And I said, really? I said, uh, he goes, oh, oh man, he's going on. And, and then that's when Kim suddenly spoke up and said, wait a second, wait a second. You need to look at the verse before, verse 22. Look at verse 21, because that's the context, and that's where it really starts. Because when I say the word submit, I know automatically in this day, in this age, in this culture, there are some who are automatically going, what, doesn't the Bible tell? The wife submits to the husband? How, how dare it say that? How dare? That's not for today. That's not for this culture. And what we find out real quickly is you're reading it out of context. Because in verse 21, Kim pointed out, it says, husband and wife submit to each other. You submit to each other first. And so we begin to see how that shapes and how that begins to come out and is played out here in Scripture. Ephesians 5.21, out of respect for Christ, be courteously reverent. In fact, circle those words and just write down the word submit because so many of your Bibles just say the word submit right there. Out of respect for Christ, in other words, because you love Christ, because you're obedient to Christ, because you have been saved by Christ, out of respect for Christ, be courteously reverent to one another. Wives, understand and support your husbands in ways that show your support for Christ. The husband provides leadership to his wife the way Christ does to his church, not by domineering, but by cherishing. In other words, the, the word submit here is a race towards serving one another. It's not one person being a doormat and the other person being a dictator. No, instead, it's the two coming together, submitting themselves because they love Christ to one another. You're demonstrating the very love of Christ here. It says, so just as the church submits to Christ as he exercises such leadership, wives likewise submit to their husbands. And then this, husbands, go all out in love for your wives, exactly as Christ did for the church. A love marked by giving and not getting. Christ's love makes the church whole. His words evoke her beauty, 
Everything he does and says is designed to bring the best out of her, dressing her in dazzling white silk, radiant with holiness. He says, and that is how husbands ought to love their wives. They're really doing themselves a favor since they're already one in marriage. And there is the picture that we're given of Christ and the church, Christ and his bride, of the husband and the wife, and how the two submit to one another out of love, racing to serve and meet needs in their mates. I've got four things I've written down, what I call four steps or stepping towards these different things that we see outlined here in Scripture this morning, and we're going to go through them here in a moment. But uh, let me just begin by saying, I begged her. I went, I, I tried for the longest time to convince her. I, I said, come on, won't you? And, and she resisted, resisted, resisted. She said, no, 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 no. And I said, come on, please, please. And finally she said, okay, I, I'll do that. I was excited that she said that I will do that. But she said, but there is one condition. She says, you can't leave me. You can't, you can't run off away from me. You got to stick with me the whole time. I'm not talking about our marriage here. I'm talking about the time I asked Kim to run a half marathon. <laughs> you see, I had run several races like that, and I said, hey, why don't you come run with me? And she goes, are you kidding? No, I can't do that. I don't want to do that. That sounds too tough. And I said, I know you can do it. I know you can do that. And you can, it's going to be awesome when we could, we could run this race and we can finish this thing together. And, and she said, no, no, no. But finally she said, okay, okay, I'll do it. But you got to make sure you don't run off and leave me. You better run with me every step of the way. And I said, I promise you I will do that. I'll stand I'll, right beside you every step away. We're going to run this race. And the day came, and, and the gun went off, and we started running. Man, it was not easy. In fact, there were times when it was really hard, but we ran. We began to run this race together. I want that to be the picture here this morning. I want you to think of, remember I talked about the vision? Think of that finish line. It's a long ways off for some of us. For others, it might be a little bit closer, not so far, but think of that finish line and finishing together. And how is it? What are those steps that we have to do in order to get there? Well, the first one I want you to write down is this. Number one, keep stepping towards godliness. We have to keep stepping towards godliness. And some of you are like, well, I'd expect a preacher to say that. Of course, keep stepping towards godliness. But let me, let me just say this. Those who are Christians have an incredible advantage for a healthy marriage. When you put in place the biblical principles, you make the odds so much better that you will be able to finish that race together. We, you see, God's word, God's law, if we, break, if we break God's law, then the law will break us. It bites back. We can't take what is written in God's word and disregard it and say this is old stuff for an old time. It's a new day, and I want to do it my way. No, God's word is timeless. And God's law can bring health to a marriage. He wants what's best. He wants you to have that vision. He wants it to last, even as you do. Hey, listen, I've done a lot, a lot, a lot of weddings. And every time I do a wedding, that wedding at that day that these two people are being wed, I know they have this vision of forever. Uh, there are songs about forever. There are vows about forever. They're on and on. It's this image of forever. I've never had somebody come up to me after the wedding, the groom saying, hey, pastor, appreciate that. We're really hoping to get a good two years out of this one. 
No, in their mind, they're going, I want it to last. But please understand that God has put that in their mind. God has put that in our hearts that we want it to go on and last. And that's a good vision to have. And with that vision then, though, we have to say, well, God, what do you want me to do so that it will last? What principles do I put into place? And I would say step towards godliness. Keep stepping towards godliness. What does that mean? Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 4. Don't look out for your own interests, but take an interest in others, too. You must have the same attitude. Circle the word attitude, if you will that Christ Jesus had. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Now here's the deal, if your attitude becomes more and more like Christ, your actions will become more and more like Christ. As you begin to take on his attitude, you also begin to display the actions of Christ in your marriage. The actions of Christ, greater love has no man, than that he lay down his life for his friend, that deep, that best friend, that mate, that marriage partner, and being at that place where you're every day going, I will lay my life down for you, lay my life down for you, I give my life for you, I'll sacrifice myself for you. That same attitude that Christ Jesus had. You see, when we chase after the things of God, when we follow after Christ, when we, when we begin to absorb the Scripture, it begins to change us. It begins to transform us. God begins to work in us and on us and through us. I'm going to have you write down several practical things. And one practical thing in order to do this, do this, just write this, number one, read God's love letter. Go read God's love letter. God's love letter to you. Do you know that, that this whole scripture right here is one big long love letter that God has written to you? And as you study this and as you read this, as you absorb this, you're reading about the love God has for you. You know what it is actually doing as you take this in? Is it's filling up your love reservoir. So very often where marriages go bad is we are not understanding, we are not filling up the love reservoir in our lives that can only be filled up by God. Instead, two people will come in a marriage and one person will say, you've got to fill up my love reservoir. No, you've got to fill up my love reservoir. And we're trying to get that mate to fill up this place that truly only God can fill up. But when our love reservoir is filled up with the godly love, the love that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ and who we find ourselves in him, then suddenly we have love to give to our mate, to share with our mate. We're able to share with them the greatest love of all, the love of God that flows through each person as they're willing. But we have to first begin with reading God's love letter. Hey, hey, let me tell you, God's word has so much to say about marriage, uh, more so than you'd probably imagine or think. Do you, do you guys know that, that uh, there's a book of the Bible, it's called Hosea. I would encourage you to go read Hosea sometime. And, and, and as you're reading it, go, and I thought my marriage was having a tough time. Eh? Do, you, do you know you can go and read Song of Solomon? And it talks about what makes her turned on and what makes him turned on? Yeah, that's in the Bible, guys. Do you know all throughout Scripture it talks about that marriage relationship so much so that, that even, even in Scripture it's, it's, hey, you want to know what a marriage is all about? Look at Jesus and his bride. And so we're able to understand, we're able to see, we're able to realize. I would challenge you, read God's love letter. The second thing I want to challenge you, practical thing, number two, 
is focus on becoming. Okay, just write that down. I'll explain what I'm talking about. Focus on becoming, becoming, instead of focus on changing the other person. Focus on becoming the man of God that God wants you to be. Focus on becoming the woman of God that God wants you to be, that he's created you to be. Focus on becoming rather than focus on changing what you don't like in the other person. I'm, I'm a fix-it kind of guy. Any other fix-it guys in here? Huh? Fix it. If, if something's broken around the house, I, I, go to, I, I go quickly to the Home Depot. Um, that's where us doers get things done, you know? <laughs> and it's, it's wonderful. I can go on Home Depot, and I can buy the parts that I need, and I can come back and, and put, snap it together and do this and do that, and boom, it's fixed. The problem comes when I try to do that with my wife. Because I can't go to Home Depot and get this and this and this and come back and go, boom, I fixed you. No, I need to focus instead on myself and becoming what God wants me to be. So often we marry the perfect person and then suddenly realize that they're not the perfect person. Now we got to fix them to be the perfect person that we think they should be. But it's not my job to do that fixing in that person. It's my job to come before the Lord and say, you change me. You change me. You make me to be the person that you want me to be. And I'm going to trust her with you. I'm going to trust him with you. Focus on becoming the man or the woman that God has chosen. You. Listen, listen. Marriage is, is, is a, a tool that God, probably one of the best, maybe the best tool that God uses to shape you into being what he wants you to be, to purify you, to grow you up, to change you, to cleanse you, to get you to that place of presenting you as holy and blameless. And he, so does, he does this so well through marriage. You see, if I'm not married... I can so easily go without even noticing some of the things that need changing in me. But those of you who have been married for some time, you know that God often uses that spouse of yours to expose those areas that need changing, right? Uh, in, in, in your laundry room, there's a washing machine. And that washing machine is used for what? Getting your clothes clean, Right? To, to getting out the dirt out of, out of the clothes and, and cleansing those clothes, making them clean, making them pure. But in the middle of that washing machine is something called agitator. agitator. Do you know sometimes God puts your spouse in your life to be that holy agitator? <laughs> to work in what's good and to work out what's bad which is a reason why you can thank God for every time your husband or wife drives you crazy. God, what are you teaching me? What are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to put into my life? How are you trying to change me and shape me into being the man of God that you want me, the woman of God that you want me to be? Number one is keep stepping towards godliness. Keep stepping towards godliness. Number two, keep stepping towards servanthood. Keep stepping towards servanthood. Who goes first? You go first. You serve first. Husbands, you take the lead. You go. See who can serve first. Take the lead. Go. Run towards being a servant. Matthew 20, 26 to 28, Jesus says this. He goes, but among you, it's going to be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, pastor. I know the question's coming. 
What about, what about if, I, if I go and I start to serve and I serve and I serve and they're not responding with serving? my serving. They're not reciprocating. What if I find myself in a situation where I am trying and I am serving and I'm serving and it just doesn't come back my direction? Guess what? That makes you more like Christ. And you become even more like Christ. One of the ways we serve is by understanding and learning about the one that we're serving and how we can best serve them. The ways we do that, one, practical ways, we learn their needs, learn their needs. Um, in fact, here's, here's the deal. I'm going to get you to write these down, okay, and uh, learn their needs. Uh, this book's been around for a long time now, Hartley is the name. Uh, it's called His Needs, Her Needs, and it outlines The top five needs of women and the top five needs of men. And by the way, they're very different, okay? But uh, how about this? Let's uh, let's start with uh, uh, men. Go ahead and pick up your pens. You're going to write down the top five needs of the woman in your life, okay? You're going to do that first. Uh, Number one on the list for women is affection. Affection. Some of your guys are like, affection, uh-huh, no, 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 we're, we're, no, I know what you're thinking, huh? I know. Now, what we're talking about here is hugging, cuddling, and that's it. <laughs> Got that? All right, all right. Um, number two is conversation. <laughs> I got an amen. Yes, yes. Talk. They like to talk and talk and, and talk. Conversation. Number three, honesty. Honesty. Number four, financial support. Didn't get an amen for that right there. Amen. Feel free, ladies. Okay. Financial support. And number five, family commitments. Family commitments. Okay. Those are the top five for the ladies. Now, top five for men. Okay. Ladies, pick up your pens, right? No surprise here. Number one, sex. <laughs> uh, Knew that one was coming, huh? (laughs) Number two, recreational companionship. (laughs) That's uh, watch the Super Bowl tonight, right? There we go. Number three, attractive spouse. Attractive spouse. In other words, when you go to the game, he wants to have you right there looking good, right? Number four. (laughs) You ready for this one? Domestic support. (laughs) Okay. And then number five, admiration and respect. Admiration and respect. Got those? Okay, those are the top five needs. A practical way, learn those needs. Start to put into practice some of those things. Exercise some of those things. Uh, For some, it'll be a stretch at first. It'll be tough at first. It'll seem very unnatural at first to do some of those things, but put those into place and work to meet those needs. Uh, The second thing I would challenge you with in in, uh, uh, practical things involving servanthood uh, it's what we call the love languages, and you guys probably saw an ad for that up here. When I say ad, um, uh, new class is starting next uh, Sunday. How many of you have heard of the five love languages? Have you heard of those? Okay. Um, yeah, uh, you might jump into that class um, next, starting next Sunday. Really, really good. But uh, five love languages, let me, uh, Kim and I, we read this book years and years and years ago, didn't we? And uh, what are they? Um, 
Acts of service, um, qu quality time, right? Gifts, um, words of affirmation, and physical touch. Okay, physical touch. And uh, in other words, we all uh, show love and interpret love by and one of those one of those five love languages, and, and it's not always, you don't always show it in the same way that you interpret it either, and so that's where it can even get complicated. I remember when Kim and I, we, we were young, we had just gotten married, and uh, she was working um, somewhere, and, and of course, I got off earlier than she did in the day, and I remember coming home, and, and uh, the way that I show love naturally it, my love language of giving love naturally is by acts of service. And I remember coming home and, and I thought to myself, oh man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make dinner tonight and I'm going to set it up. I'm going to get all, and she's gonna, all she's going to have to do is walk through the door and this incredible dinner is going to be spread out for her and she's going to feel so loved by me doing this. And so I put together this dinner, I put together this meal, got it all set up and she comes in through the door after getting off work and she sees all that I've done and she gets so upset. And I'm like, what's wrong? And she's, she almost, I, I, think, I, I think she starts to cry and, and I'm like, what? this is not working out the way I had it planned. Uh, what I'm showing you love. I'm showing you love. But her interpretation of that was that I thought she didn't know how to cook dinner good. And so I had to hurry up and beat her to cook in dinner. And so she didn't even pick up at all my expression of love, which was acts of service, because her love language is not acts of service as to how she knows what love really is. And, and I'll be honest with you, and, and we talk about this all the time, we have had to work hard on, uh, throughout 30 years of marriage trying to understand each other's love languages with one another so that we can show love and we can receive love and give love to one another. But it's, it's a wonderful thing. Learn the love language. Learn, learn the love language of your spouse. Some practical things there. Keep stepping towards servanthood. Number three. Keep stepping towards honor, towards honor, honoring one another. Romans 12, 10, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Love each other with genuine affection, take delight in honoring each other. How do we honor somebody? What are ways that we honor one another? I'm going to give you real quick just a, a few things right here, okay? Number one, listen. When you actually listen to somebody, you honor somebody. And uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a natural thing sometimes. In fact, that's something that, uh, and Kim will tell you, so often she says, listen to me. Listen. Listen. Listen to what I'm saying. Because too often we don't take time to listen to one another. We just... Or wanting to say something to one another, to speak. So take time to listen, listen. But then also you honor somebody with the words that come out of your mouth, with your speech, with your speech. Make a purpose to speak words that only build up and don't tear down. Honor with your speech. Praise your spouse to their face and praise your spouse behind their back. Sometimes we might praise our spouse to their face and then when, when they're not around, we're, we're cutting them down behind their back. It, it, might, be, it might be the woman who, yeah, yeah honey, and praises to his face, but when, when she's with her girlfriends, she's going, oh, you wouldn't believe how stupid my husband is. And the truth is, he really knows how you feel about him. Don't cut him down behind his back. Or it might be the man who praises his wife to her face, but behind her back, he's saying to his friends, oh, she's nagging me about this and this all the time. And cuts her down. Don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, let your, 
your spouse needs to know that they are safe with any words that will ever come out of your mouth. And that's how you honor them with your mouth. And number two, how about this? Accept and appreciate and adjust according to differences. Accept and appreciate and adjust. That's how you honor them, by accepting who they are, appreciating who they are, and making yourself adjustments according to who they are. You honor them. Accept them. Appreciate. How many of you noticed that men or win, women are different? Have you noticed that? <laughs> Have you noticed men and women can be very different, right? Uh, she might be more emotional. He might be more logical at times. She might be feeling this way. He might be thinking this way. It's sometimes hard. The differences can be dividing if we're not careful. But when we see it and we accept it and we adjust according, we actually end up honoring them in that way. Yesterday, uh, or was it yesterday? No, two days ago, Kim and I walked out to the garage and, and we went to get into the car. And when, when I got into the car, I... I couldn't hardly get my leg in, and I had to press the I had to press the button to suddenly adjust it back so I could I could fit into that seat and drive from there. I, but here's the deal: I had to do that because she's different than me. Uh, she she can't sit that far back. She has to sit up a little bit closer and 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 adjust the mirror. Now when I when I got in, I didn't I didn't go sit into the car and go, oh man, she's so ridiculous. I gotta I gotta do this because of how she. I didn't do that, did I? And no. In fact, I actually I, I appreciate the difference, right? I appreciate how God shaped her and how God made her. I, I, don't, I don't complain about it. I don't curse it. No, instead, I accept it, I appreciate it, and I make adjustments myself so that we can fit, honor each other, honor each other. Keep stepping towards honor in your marriage. Number four, last one. Keep stepping towards enjoyment. Enjoyment. Do you enjoy? Do you still enjoy? Do you take time to enjoy one another? John 10, 10, Jesus said, I came so they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. What does it mean to enjoy one another? I can't tell you, many times I've looked at my wife and I've said, Kim, I love you. And she says, but do you like me? <laughs> do you realize we can love without actually liking? But the question here is, do you take time being that best friend to enjoy and to like one another? Do you purposefully do things that you can enjoy together? Some practical things here. Attack busyness. Attack busyness. A busyness can be one of those things that makes us lose the enjoyment in our relationships. It can sap us of any, any real enjoyment because we're busy. Are we busy people, huh? We're busy, man. When somebody, when somebody comes up to you and says, hey, how things going? Busy. Yeah, I'm busy and proud of being busy. We're going all the time. I, we've got so many things that we got to go and we got to get done and we got to do. We are busy and, man, that busy. We, I mean, our day is packed full. We got all this stuff and it's that busyness that can, that can ruin us. Slow it down. Make time to be together. Take, take a stroll with your spouse. All right. When was the last time you moseyed? <laughs> go, go mosey with your spouse somewhere and just enjoy being together. That's the first one, attack busyness. 
Uh, this is the second one. Number two, if you're not doing this already, learn to date again. Learn to date again. Don't stop dating. Don't, don't stop going out with one another. Start, whatever that date might be. One of the things I, I, I loved about my grandparents, uh, every Valentine's Day, you know, they'd always tell us that this is what they do. Every, they always had a date on Valentine's Day. And the date went like this. My grandmother said, every Valentine's Day, what we do is we get into the car and we, we drive up to the Ecker Drugs. And she says, we go in the Ecker Drugs and we go to the card aisle and it's got all the Valentine's cards there. And she goes, he'll go, he'll go look for a card and I'll go look for a card. And after a few minutes, he walks up to me with a card and says, I got this card for you. And she goes, and I'll say, I got this card for you. And we stand there and we read the cards and then we put them back and we leave. <laughs> what a great date, huh? But date, date, date your mate, okay? Date your mate. And do the things you used to do. That's the third thing. Start doing again some of the things. Do you, do you guys know that in the book of Revelation, that Jesus talking to his bride, the church, at one point goes, I have this against you. You've lost your first love. It's like you... You fell, you fell out of love with me. And then, but he says this, he goes, here's what you need. Go and do the things you did at first. Go back and do the things you did at first. And that's good advice in a marriage relationship. Go back and do the things you did at first. You remember what you did at first? You remember, guys, you remember how you treated her at first? How you were so, so careful to take care of her. Do you, you remember when, on, on that, that date where you went and you opened her door for her? And said, here, come on. I'll help you. Help you. And, and are, are your feet in? Okay. Be careful. And you close the door. Yeah. You remember that? But, but now you run and jump in the car. And when she tries to get in, you click it locked. <laughs> right? Oh, that's fun. That's fun. <laughs> but w w what if you put into play some of the things you did at first? Go back and open the door again. What if you do some of the things that you did at first just to show, just to show that you're in this race for the long haul with her, with him? So anyway, we, we're running. And as we're running, it's going good like the first three, four, five, even six miles, you know, running along. Beautiful sights, fun to see. We're in Charleston, South Carolina, looking at all the houses and the water and just running this half marathon, you know. And everything's good and good and good until, boy, we start to get about to, to mile number eight. And Kim goes, oh, oh, my knee, my knee is hurting. I said, come on, keep going, keep going. We keep on going, but my knee, my knee is hurting. Come on, come on. We get to mile number nine, and she's really hurting by now. And, and as we, right, come on, come on. We got it. We got this thing. We're going we're gonna to finish this thing. Come on, keep going and run along. And, oh, my knee. Oh, I, I can't. And, and then she looks at me, and she goes, I hate you. <laughs> I said, what, what? What do you mean? I said, she goes, you made me do this race. I hate you. And she's hurting really, really bad, and, and it's only getting worse. And we still got a little ways to go, you know. But I'm like, come on, we're going to do this thing. I'm sticking there right with her, right by her side, encouraging her and challenging her. And, and come on, we're going to do this. And, and I'm hurting, I'm hurting, I hate you, I hate you. And come on, come on. And, and, and pretty soon this lady on crutches passes us, you know. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm like, look at her. Are you going to let her beat you? Come on, and, and no, and we're still running, still running, and, and just, and oh, she's getting upset and madder and madder, and it's just, it's ugly. It's like really ugly for those last four miles, but, but boy, I tell you what, there came the time, the time finally came 
where we see the, the finish line. And it was amazing because as we, as we hobble across that finish line, my wife reaches over, grabs my hand, and we finish together. <laughs> finish the race. We finish the race. You know what's going to happen? Inevitably. After that 30 years or that 20 or whatever, 10. Maybe you're old. But that, that day will come. Where one of you will probably have to take the other and sign them in at the hospital. Go get in the car and go back home alone, sit in the uh, living room, knowing you'll probably never sleep in the same bed again, and you'll, you'll, you'll sit there and uh, Think of all the first. The first day married. Oh, back up. The first date, right? <laughs> the first kiss. The first day that you got married. The first credit card bill. The first baby. The first graduation, the first grandkid, <laughs> the first day that you're retired, all the first, and it'll hit you just how blessed you were. And you'll thank God. For the vision, the marriage that he wanted for you. I believe that's God's idea for those who would have it, his best. Let's run towards that. As we close out this morning, um, just, if you're sitting next to your spouse, just take their hand. And let's pray. To know the love that lasts, you need to know the love that lasts, the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. If you never put your faith and trust in him, do that now here today. Call out to him and say, Jesus, I believe you died for me. Right now, the best I know how I'm receiving you as my Savior. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. And be my God and my Savior, my friend, forever and ever. In that moment, if you believed and believed with your, your whole heart, you can say thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. And it's that love then from Christ filled, fills us up, enables us to love one another. Help us, Father, we pray. Help us to fight for what matters because of the love that you've given to us. Father, move through each one of us. Show us, lead us, shape us in these marriages with purpose that you have for us. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.